Hi, folks. It's Voss here from the com. The com. Hey, we're coming here with another great podcast. We certainly appreciate you guys tuning in. Thanks for being a part of the show. As always, to see the video version of this, you can go free for an unlimited time. You want to grab this deal, what's available at youtube.com for chess Chris Voss. You can see all the wonderful things we're watching over there. Go to goodreads.com for chess Chris Voss. I think one of my giveaways from one of my books is still running over there uh you can go over there and see everything we're reading reviewing all the cool stuff that uh some of the authors that come on the show are doing also go to all of our groups there's so many of them facebook linkedin twitter instagram tiktok all those places the cool kids are going we're just not on snapchat yet i don't know why maybe it's obvious why not uh anyway guys be sure to go over there and subscribe to all the channels and follow us over there. Today we have an amazing author on the show. His new book uh, just came out October 19th, 2021. The book is called Liberty is Sweet, The Hidden History of the American Revolution. You may have heard of it. It's pretty cool, and it brought you to a democracy where we are today. Uh, and we're going to have Woody Holton, the author on the show today. He's going to be talking to us about the book and all the cool stuff that went into it. Uh, Woody is a PhD from Duke University. He's a Cosland professor, or I'm sorry, a Mick Cosland professor of history at the University of South Carolina, where he teaches classes on African Americans, Native America, early American women, and the origins of the Constitution, Abigail Adams, and the era of the American Revolution. Welcome to the show, Woody. How are you? I'm good. I'm good, Chris. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for coming. I certainly appreciate it. And congratulations on the new book. Yeah, yeah. 12 years. It's nice to finish. 12 years it took you to write this book? Holy crap. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I teach before? a lot, but, uh, but uh, and I've got, uh, I had my kids grow up during those 12 years, but wow. it's been a fun thing to do at the same time. So give us your plugs so people can find you on the interwebs and get to know you better. Um. The, well, hidden history is the part I'd, I'd stress. And, and for instance, talking about the origins of the revolution, I mm. realized having taught this for 30 years, why did they rebel? Mm. I was asking the wrong question mm. because it was parliament that rebelled. The mm. colonists, the free colonists at least, were completely satisfied with their relationship with the British Empire as of, say, 1762. Mm -hmm. It was parliament that was dissatisfied that wanted to levy taxes, that wanted to restrict their taking of land from Native Americans and so forth. So it's parliament that tried to change things. Wow. And it was the colonists who just wanted to hang on to what they had. Yeah. It's always that government getting in the way. There so. <laughs> so give us uh, your websites where people can find you on the interweb, get to know you better. And then let's get into what motivates you to write the book. Um, so I embarrassed to say, I don't have a website, but uh, mm -hmm. I'm very active on Twitter and I'm there. I'm Woody Holton, USC, mm -hmm. uh, the university, the old USC, the classic, not the one in California, Woody Holton, USC. And so for instance, one thing I have there is a, a long running hashtag countdown to 1619 Mm -hmm. That was my endorsement in a way of the 1619 project. And it was 76 quotes of white Americans from the revolutionary era who were angry at the British for an alliance that they made with enslaved people. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you go to my Twitter page, you'll find things like that. Oh, that's pretty interesting. So uh, let's see. Uh, what motivated you want to write this book? What, I mean, you're, you're just like, I really want to write something for 12 years? or Yes, exactly. So people would leave me alone. No, um, there are great histories of the revolution, uh, and there are great history of women in the revolution, or Native Americans, African Americans, but they tend to be really separate. Mm -hmm. And more recently, historians have had a chapter in the back on Blacks and a chapter in the backs on Indigenous people and so forth. And my whole idea was to not have separate chapters, but to integrate them all into the same story. Because I think you can't understand why people like Thomas Jefferson uh, and George Washington are immensely wealthy. George, John Hancock's the richest guy in Boston. Those aren't the kind of people who usually start revolutions. So why did they start revolutions? Mm -hmm. Well, one thing you need to understand to why they did that involves Native Americans, because it was indigenous people who uh, sided with the enemy, that is the French, in mm -hmm. the previous war. And the British government said, we don't want another war against the Indians. And so in 1763, the British government drew a line along the crest of the Appalachian Mountains saying, 
to white settlers like Jefferson and Washington, who were more land speculators than settlers, you can't go west of this line because that's going to stop the Indians from going to war with us. And the line pissed the colonists off, but what even more pissed them off was to enforce the line, the British government put 10,000 peacekeeping troops in America, mostly along that border. And here's a line from modern politics that applies in this case. The British government essentially put a west a, a wall on the western border and thought it would be reasonable for the colonists to pay for it. Um, and that's oh, just, they pay for it too. Well, the Stamp Act. You know, if people know anything about the the American Revolution, they know no taxation without representation. Uh -huh. But my point is, the first big tax, the Stamp Act, wouldn't have happened if there hadn't been for indigenous people because oh, wow. they. Attacking the colon, attacking the, the the British colonies, the British government's got to pay to put down those Indian rebellions. Doesn't want any more rebellions, and so they put these peacekeeping troops there, and they go after the colonists to pay for it. And that's taxation without representation. Wow, man, it's so interesting how the history of this country is so steeped in racism, <laughs> and it, you know everything they did to the Indians and the original lie of what was it the. Uh, the uh, the shining city on the hill and I mean it's just it's so insane and and a lot of it has been whitewashed and buried like you say it's it's usually not put in some of the books I do remember the Stamp Act though learning that in in school I I guess I did learn something in school good for you but see I want your children and grandchildren when they learn about the Stamp Act to learn and I'd go this far if there had been no Native Americans there would have been no Stamp Act. Because that's where the money was going to, was to pay for those peacekeeping troops on the frontier. Wow. And so was that was, was that before or after the Boston uh, Harbor thing? And Boston City Party was on December 16th, 1773. And by the way, it's also a Native American story because I bet you did learn in elementary school that they the guys who poured the tea into the harbor dressed up like Indians. Yeah, they were trying to put off that they were, yeah. I remember well, that, yeah. and they weren't actually, I mean, the textbooks say they were trying to disguise themselves as Indians. That's not true. Uh, they did blacken their faces, you know, as anybody doing a crime might do. Uh, but the real reason uh, that they portrayed themselves as Indians and stuck feathers in their hats and all that was that for them, Native Americans represented perfect freedom. And and so it's that's one of the wonderful ironies of the revolution, or you could say horrific ironies, is that at the same time that they're swiping Indians' land, as you talked about, they're also admiring the Indians as the symbols of freedom. And in fact, in cartoons in Britain, both pro-American cartoons and anti-American cartoons, their stand-in for the Americans, the allegory for America, was almost always an Indian. Really? Um, yeah, yeah, that stood for America. Um, and and there was a lot, of, you know, it, there's, there's, there's a noble savage myth that runs alongside the savage, savage myth that I'm sorry, very sorry to say that our Declaration of Independence, it says a lot of beautiful things, but it also talks about the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of uh, warfare is the indiscriminate um, uh, um, butchering of women and children. I don't remember the details of that part, but the, 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 the wow. money phrase is the merciless Indian savages. And so, they are really part of the story in all kinds of ways, both as protecting their homelands and also as these representatives of freedom. I yeah. Freedom, you could say. I think it was, uh, we had an author on the show that talked about, uh, I think it was Andrew Jackson. Wasn't he the crazy one? Well, and A lot of them were crazy, but yeah. he was a crazy Indian hater. For yeah, sure. and he had the, they called it the mountaintop, and he even gave the speech, I think, from the floor of the, of the Congress where he was like, it was something about the mountaintop and it had to do with basically a eminent domain that white people thought they had. And Indians were, you know, lesser uh, human beings or not even human beings. And, and therefore it gave them reason to just kill and plunder and take whatever they want with their land. Uh, it, was, it was really extraordinary. Some of the, just the horrific stuff that we did in the history of this country and what motivated this, the creation of this country. Yes, and I'm, but I'm also going to give you a yes, but on that, Chris, because okay. for me, the more that's certainly true, but uh, the more exciting because not so well known aspect of this is that all of these groups we haven't talked much about enslaved people. One in five 
residents of the 13 colonies that rebelled were enslaved. And we could, we're now starting to talk about places like Monticello and Mount Vernon, not as plantations, but as what they were for the majority of the people who lived on them, slave labor camps. Mm -hmm. But my point is not that, that's certainly valid. Uh, but my point is to see that they were not just victims. They weren't, they, African Americans, Native Americans, we talk about women, are not just um, uh, 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 speed bumps, but they're actually affecting things. So can I give you yeah. another example? of Sure, of yes, please. So there was a guy, uh, you know, the Declaration of Independence, July 4, 1776. I've heard here's of it. Sort of, here's sort of a bar bet question. Who was the first person to quote that phrase, all men are created equal? And the answer is Lemuel Haynes, who was a black man serving in George Washington's Continental Army. In 1776, he wrote an anti-slavery pamphlet and he was looking for an epigraph. I don't know if you use epigraphs in your books. I don't, but, you know, a quote at the start mm -hmm. to set the mood. And he was looking for a good phrase. And that's when the Declaration of Independence came out. And he says, oh, this is perfect. And he thereby became the first person to quote the Declaration of Independence. And here's why that's important. Hardly anybody else was quoting that part of the Declaration. Mm -hmm. They saw the Declaration of Independence, to use a loaded term, as a secession ordinance. It's really a foreign policy document saying that these 13 nations from New Hampshire down to Georgia, which have been part of the British Empire, are now going to break off that alliance and form their own alliance with each other. So it, it was a it was justifying the right of 13 nations to break off from their bigger nation of Britain, foreign mm -hmm. policy. What Lemuel Haynes did was start a process that shifted the focus of the Declaration from secession document to universal declaration of human rights. And in fact, the vast majority of the people who quoted the Declaration of Independence for the rest of the 18th century were abolitionists, people fighting slavery, whether they were African American, like Lemuel Haynes, or many people have heard of Benjamin Banneker, who also quoted it, but also quoted not the secession phrases like the whites were doing, but quoted created equal. Uh, and, and, and also white abolitionists did that as well. And later we get women's rights activists. They quote created equal and they transformed this document, which Lincoln said, if they hadn't done this, this would have been wadding on the field, you know, just waste wow. paper. Because, you know, they, okay, they got their independence, so we, who, who needs the, the document? It was anti-slavery people, black and white, women's rights activists, male and female, who transformed the declaration into this universal declaration of human rights. Wow, that's pretty amazing. I mean, because there's a lot of people that talk about how in the Declaration of Independence, or I'm thinking of the Constitution, when all men are created and equal, aren't they? No, when, when, the, when they give the, to, the, they the power to landowners? The, um, it it gave well. This is something that uh, that that I'd like to talk about, which is the incredible gap between the principles and the people. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think we must, all of us, black, white, anything, must love the, what Jefferson wrote. All mm -hmm. men are created equal, especially after Elizabeth Cady Stanton revised it for the Seneca Falls Declaration in 1848. All men and women are created equal. So mm. we love the writings, but you kind of have to hate the guy because mm. when he wrote those words, he owned, he, well, over the course of his lifetime, he owned 600 people. And unlike some of the other founders, Jefferson constantly made it clear that he knew that slavery was a tremendous evil. And his fellow mm. delegates in Congress knew that too. One way you know it is that they refer to slaves a lot. Uh, in there, and, and in fact, in their sort of capstone grievance, but they never used the word. And they were more freak, more likely to refer to African Americans. Of course, that term didn't exist, but they they were most likely to say Negroes uh, or blacks or slaves. None of those three words is in either the Declaration or the Constitution, but they are in the records we have of the conversations that led to those documents. And so, oh yeah, what are we gonna do about the blacks this? What are we gonna do about the Negroes that? What are we gonna do about the slaves this other thing? But then when they wrote the document, they wrote around those terms mm -hmm. because they didn't want to advertise the fact, here we are proclaiming freedom in the Declaration and establishing a government in the Constitution 
that would have the three fist clause that would have the fugitive slave act that uh, and so forth they didn't want to acknowledge that a whole lot of it was about keeping enslaved people enslaved so did they foresee that because i know there was a lot of arguments at that time going on about slavery and anti-slavery and so did they foresee that maybe maybe they when they wrote it they're just like you know there might come a day in the future that you know everyone will be equal we're still waiting for that time but <laughs> yeah um sadly uh but maybe they foresaw the future i mean they they certainly were really good at foreseeing the future <laughs> that document uh well what they foresaw is a great question and uh someone else who was involved in that question earlier than you were was abraham lincoln because mm, it definitely was earlier both are yes uh both during the lincoln douglas debates and during the uh, gettysburg address he made this extraordinary claim that Jefferson, although a slaveholder, uh, was sincere in his opposition to slavery, but knew that it wasn't realistic to persuade other people or even himself to be against slavery, but that Jefferson had this theoretical opposition to slavery. So he put all men are created equal in the document. He sort of mm -hmm. snuck it in there, according to Lincoln. Really? And I would describe it as a time bomb. It's not going to blow up right away, but it's there. And at some point, it will be activated and it will result in freedom. And in fact, it did. It took a civil war to do it and massive agitation on the part of slaves and their few uh, white supporters. Quakers in particular were big anti-slavery people. It took a lot to do it. But uh, I think this is the spiritual side of Lincoln in thinking that Jefferson deliberately put it there as a time as as a sort of a click a ticking time bomb that would eventually blow up and and start to make freedom more universal but I, it's it's a cool it's a cool theory anyway you know between that and the madison papers um it's extraordinary the foresight they put into it you know like just recently uh you know Ma i think it was madison or you know the the argument was does does the voting held by the federal government is the voting held by the states and we just barely dodged an authoritarian overthrow of our government because the because Madison put the um, put the voting with the states and they couldn't override it at a federal level. That saved this this democracy and that and a couple people actually. Um, Capitol Police who risked their lives on January sixth. That is true too, uh, and sadly that was a rehearsal warm up. So we're probably. We've got more to go if you study. I'm sure you know studying history and, and fascism and authoritarianism. Yeah. Um, between the revolution, the Russian Revolution, and and uh, the what is it, the beer hall of Nazi Germany? I mean, we're we're up a creek. But, but seriously, though, um, the um, not like that wasn't serious either. But uh, it, it, the fact that the states had the control. Uh, there was no, there was no really uh, the, of the election and the voting systems. And to my understanding, Madison put that in there on purpose because he foresaw the future of someone at a federal level cool. seizing power and taking control, which is you know now being uh, rechanged in different GOP states. Uh, but uh, at least the at, the at the that level. But you know, at least there's still semblance of of states that aren't insane. But yeah, it was interesting. Like I say, how 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 much foresight they had to see. 250 years in the future, roughly. Well, Madison um, wanted to go even further. He was actually disappointed with the Constitution as written because the biggest thing he was just, well, two things he was disappointed about. One, he was from a very populous state. Virginia was the most populous. And so he wanted the Senate, like the House of Representatives, to be apportioned according to population. And so it's, it would be interesting to think about that now that California would have 10 senators and Wyoming would have one. If that yeah. were the case, a lot of legislation I'm sensing that you and I both support would have passed um, because the, the right now there are senators who represent more sheep than people. Yeah. And 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 meanwhile, those two California senators are each representing however many people they have. There are now 60 million uh, people. Uh, it's it's it is a very undemocratic setup. And he 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 didn't want that um, mm. now. He had a dog in the fight because he happened to come from the California of 1787, which was Virginia. But the other thing he wanted, uh, it's amazing to imagine it now, he wanted the federal government to have a veto 
over state laws. Um, and uh, I'm not sure I'm even for that. Be, you know, there'd be times when that was good, when the federal government was finally ready for the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act. I sure would like for it to have been able to intervene when states like mine, South Carolina, denied African Americans the right to vote. On the other oh. hand, we can imagine a uh, there's strong sentiment that these fascists that you mentioned may control our government, uh, the the our, uh, our our House and Senate, two short years from now, um, or uh, and and then you don't want them vetoing, for instance, California passing high fuel emission standards and things like that. So all of those things cut different ways depending on in different period time, periods of time. And when you look at, I mean, the history of America, the, the states being able to have power and determine what they want to do, you see, I mean, you can disagree or agree with certain principles, but, you know, where certain laws get passed, I mean, legalization of marijuana uh, is slowly been spreading yeah. across the nation. The same thing yeah. happened with gay marriage. Uh, there's probably a lot of other different um uh, legal things that finally, you know, SCOTUS steps in and goes, I can't remember if Roe, Wade, Roe versus Wade went down that way, but, but it, it's a really, it's really amazing how much foresight they had into it. So why did you name the, the title of the book? Liberty is sweet. I was thinking of the, the book, dude, where's my car? Where he goes, dude, what's my to, to say? And he goes, sweet. And he goes, what's it say? And he says, sweet. So why, why did you name the book? Well, Liberty that's why. Sweet? No. Um, well, I did it as a kind of a little deception. Ah. Because I wanted people to think that Liberty is Sweet referred to, you know, it was a quote from a speech by Patrick Henry. You know, he's the guy who said, give me liberty or give me death mm -hmm. uh, or, or, or somebody like that, John Adams or Ben Franklin or whatever. What it actually is from, though, is a letter written to George Washington when he was commander in chief of the Continental Army. And it's from the man who was running his slave labor camp, Mount Vernon, uh, in uh, the winter of 1775, 1776, saying, and he actually it was his cousin running it. And he says, George, George, we got a problem because um, you're, you're for the revolution and I'm for the revolution, but the governor of Virginia is loyal to the crown and he's assembling his own army. And he, he his name was Governor Dunmore. He's issued an emancipation proclamation. He, and he did on November 15th, 1775, very similar to the one that Lincoln issued four score and seven years later uh, mm -hmm. in, 18, in 1862. Um, and so the, this is the British offering freedom to black Virginians, not, not to, uh, to blacks who are owned by loyalists like Governor Dunmore, who had slaves and kept them. But if you're owned by George Washington or Jefferson or any of the other patriots, and if you run away and if you can get to Governor Dunmore, he's going to put a musket in your hands and he's going to free you for fighting for your king. And wow. so so a lot of people were already talking about running. Uh, ultimately, um, uh, quite a few people would run from Mount Vernon. Thousands nationwide of African-Americans ran to the British and got free that way. So when Lund Washington wrote George Washington that winter saying, he said, oh, a lot of your slaves and even some of your servants are talking about running away. Liberty is sweet. So the point <laughs> is that liberty is sweet for Jefferson and Franklin and Hancock as they rebel against the British. But liberty is also sweet for enslaved people as they uh, run away from from Jefferson and Washington and the other enslaving sons of liberty. I love the details on this because I just kind of got the I don't know why, but. I, I, you kind of get in, 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 at least when I went to school, I'm not sure they get taught history anymore, but when I went to school, you know, they kind of gave you this uh, flowery version of it. Yeah. A bunch of people are against taxes and they did this thing and they're like, yeah, screw the British. Hey, eh? cause they're, I don't know. They got bad teeth or something. I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, and they're just like, yeah, we, we really like tea a lot. And, uh, so yeah, we're just gonna go start a revolution. And then the Beatles wrote a song about it, and that was it. Um. <laughs> Reality is so much more interesting than this cardboard. Yeah, I got that version uh, in elementary school as well. And I think they're actually doing much better uh, in high school now. I talked to a lot of, yeah. of uh, high school teachers on Twitter, and they're doing some pretty cool stuff. You know, they use Howard Zinn's 
book, People's History of the United States. Uh, but but you know, this leads to something that that I want to make sure that your listeners know about, which is there is a massive effort going on to suppress this more nuanced and uh, open-ended view of the revolution because many people in Congress, and, and including the former president uh, when he was in power, who really want to go back to the hero worshiping version um, and, and, and see history as a form of indoctrinating kids. For me, mm. history is not a series of dates. It's a series of debates. That is, the best high school teachers, and I think you can even do this at younger levels, are getting their kids into debates. So you mentioned the Boston Tea Party. We could talk about the Boston Massacre three years earlier. Were those troops justified in firing into the crowd? Um, I I get my students to do a mock uh, trial, uh, and it's interesting. The jury ends up voting that they were justified. Oh, wow. It would be that I have more mainstream type uh, students. But, you know, the crowd was throwing rocks at them. It's the same kind of arguments that you could talk about with Black Lives Matter protests or this guy in Wisconsin who got off after murdering uh, two people at, at, at that uh, protest in, in Kenosha. Um, the same issues came up in the Boston massacre. So so there's a there is a huge war going on about the Revolutionary War and how to teach it. Should we teach it? as worship these men like Je Washington and Jefferson, or should we teach it as a bunch of debates? Who was right on the Boston, uh, about the Boston massacre and who was right uh, about um, about slavery? And was it, did, was it possible to even consider uh, abolishing slavery and so forth? Uh, and of course, I'm, I'm into teaching the debates. And I think this is brilliant. Uh, I think we tried to get the author of the 1619 Project or uh, whoever's the author of that book. We, we invited them to come on the show through the publisher, so hopefully they send them to us. But to me, it's, it's much more interesting because the, the nuances of it, all the people that were involved and the motivations and everything else are just are tell a better story and give a better depth and actually it's just better history it's more interesting i mean i when i look back on it now my history was just whitewashed with a bunch of white men you know i know well, all the white men that were involved uh i know there's a lady who made the flag i think that's about the only time a lady comes into it um and black people really aren't a part of it i mean i'm just astounded you know the black person was the person who said you know all men were created equal and he didn't write the term, great. but he was the first one to quote it and sort of mm -hmm. uh, he's really shifted the spotlight. He and other anti-slavery people shifted the spotlight, turned the, mm -hmm. the Declaration of Independence from secession document into what it is today. And, and I mean, women very much. You mentioned Betsy Ross. And if we got a second um, to talk about their absolutely crucial role, mm -hmm. because, you know, we have 12 years at from 1763 to 1774, where Parliament is dissatisfied, is trying to change things, but the colon, but um, the colonists are fighting back, not at first with bullets, but the big thing they did was boycott Britain. And you know, I just seeing that uh, Biden was saying to Russia, you know, if you invade Ukraine again, we're going to econom economically boycott you like nothing you've ever seen. Well, mm -hmm. he probably knows that that was a very powerful instrument. Of the American Revolution in the early years, that is, the British uh, put a tax on tea. We boycott tea. The British put, put a tax on other things. And we boycott. At one point, the colonists were basically importing nothing from from Britain. And my point is that uh, none of that would have worked if only dudes had done it, because majority of the tea, which was people were really addicted to that Chinese tea, uh, the majority of the tea was drunk by women, and so. We see these fascinating uh, uh, things in the newspaper where a bunch of women get together and sign an agreement not to drink tea. And it's the revolution is politicizing women, even even if they don't want to be they're, mm. they're getting politically involved. Once they start uh, boycotting British cloth, you need women to spin the thread and then weave that thread uh, into cloth to replace the cloth that they used to. Import so women are really crucial to the to what um, the the colonists are doing, and then once the war gets started, I have a student who pointed this out to me. I, it's such an amazing point um, that laundresses saved lives. You know that the 
every army at that in that period mm -hmm. had lots of women with it. You know, there's a couple of ones that stand out because they dressed as men and disguised themselves as 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 men to to enlist as soldiers, but much more numerous were the women who came along. They were wives or they just needed work and the small rations they could get from the army. But here's my point. The lowliest job in the army for women was laundress. But if you're washing clothes, you're killing lice. And lice are the biggest spreaders of typhus. And oh, after really? Washington inoculated the army against smallpox, the biggest killer was typhus. So so Holy I don't know. This needs to be a bumper sticker. Laundresses save lives. Wow. Everybody or is uh, everybody it takes a village. I don't know. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, these the, army camps were absolutely were traveling villages. Wow. The, you know, it, it. I love this. To me, this is more richer history. Like, I would have loved to have heard about this when I was taught in school. Because when they taught in school, you're just kind of like, uh, yeah. So uh, they, just, they just they got drunk one day and were like, yeah, let's start a war with England. And right. uh, yeah, now we're a nation. So there you go. And right. <laughs> you're just like, Oh, the cliff notes version but no I, I like this deeper more richer thing because you kind of always knew it had to be there i never really gave it much thought because i don't know i'm busy but uh to me it's just more interesting history and i've learned so much by a lot of the authors we've on the show that have, have talked about this era and, uh, all the eras through american history and you learn just it's a rich tapestry of uh, a multitude of of all variants of people uh from all walks of life and 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 it's not it's not a monolith of of white people it's not a monolith of male people it's 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 and or just you know like yeah i the the one thing i took away from our history was no one really cared about slavery until you know abraham lincoln came along and right, you know, right. For books like yours that's not true right. um one thing i also learned from history is that one of the real things that helped end history was the invention of automation in the in the, in the cotton gin and uh i was like what and they're like yeah once that thing came around they nearly didn't you know they were able to they, they didn't really need slaves anymore because the automation I'm like holy crap yeah but it's actually the opposite of that the cotton entrenched slavery because it made it um more economical what what the cotton gen done is is pull the seeds mm -hmm. uh, out of the kind of cotton that you can grow off the coast before then cotton was grown almost exclusively on the coast but complicated reasons the uh cotton gin allows you to grow it anywhere and that's i mean he didn't know it eli, eli whitney the guy that did it invented the cotton gin was from connecticut he wasn't necessarily for slavery but he inadvertently did more to spread and continue oh really than anybody uh through that through that invention because it made made it much more economical to grow inland uh cotton they uh uh you know and, and it's the reason that we continued having slavery for 30 years longer than yeah. the British did. They had enslaved people growing sugar, but you, but we had, you know, primarily by the 19th century, slaves were growing cotton and it was incredibly profitable. And this, and the, the Southern slaveholders wouldn't give it up, but neither would a lot of Northern industrialists because the industrial revolution in America is cotton, gen, is, is cotton mills where mm -hmm. they're taking that, that slave grown cotton, manufacturing it into cloth, which goes back to be worn by slaves. So the Northern manufacturers, they needed the slaves as much as the slaveholders did, A, as suppliers, and B, as a market. They, they talked wow. about not the Whig party, but it's really true of the whole American economy as an alliance of the loom, that is the power looms, water powered uh, uh, looms uh, making cloth in the, in the North. It's an alliance of the, the loom and the lash, that is the whip that keeps those slaves working. Jesus. Oh, it's extraordinary how the whole circle of economy goes on there and the horrors of it. Um, what are some other things you want to tease out on the book and, and some you did? Uh, you talked about all the people involved in the revolution. We should mention microbes too, especially since we're dealing with COVID. Uh, a friend of mine named Elizabeth Finn wrote an amazing book called Pox Americana, but Pox was spelled with an O in that case because she made the case that george one of the or the most valuable thing that george washington did as commander-in-chief was change his mind regarding vaccination mm. or they called it inoculation at the time so smallpox was the biggest killer and 
um, there was a way to never have any chance of getting smallpox, and that was called inoculation. And what they did was take the pus or the scabs from somebody who'd had smallpox, and mm -hmm. you haven't had smallpox, they make a little cut in your arm, and they put some of those scabs in there and seal it up uh, and give you smallpox. But if you get it in this way, you have a one in a hundred chance of dying versus if you get it in the natural way, you have a one in 10 or one in five chance of dying. So inoculation was the thing to do. And the doctors urged Washington, you've got to inoculate the troops against smallpox. And he kept putting it off and putting it off because he was afraid, well, it's going to immobilize the army. It was a complicated process. The soldiers got sick while they were being inoculated. And I can't just stop the war because the British are going to keep going. Most of the British soldiers had already had smallpox, so they had lifetime immunity. So he kept saying no, 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 but he kept losing. He lost thousands of soldiers. Um, he lost probably more soldiers to smallpox than to bullets. You know, only 7,000 American soldiers were shot dead during the Revolutionary War. That's fewer than in three days at Gettysburg. But smallpox uh, was wiping them out, as were other diseases. And so he eventually came around to the idea of inoculating the army against smallpox. Um, and that, uh, according to Elizabeth Finn, and I think she makes a very persuasive case, that's really what saved the Continental Army. Wow, that's quite extraordinary. There's just so much nuance to the history, and, and it's a lot more funner to think about all these different things that tied in and that moved it. Uh, anything more, to, more you want to touch on before we go out? Uh, and I think we've covered it all. I've really appreciated uh, talking to you about it. Yeah, it's really interesting stuff. So give us your plugs so people can find you on the interwebs, uh, where, wherever they are. Okay, yeah, the only place I am, unfortunately, is Twitter, uh, but I'm active there. So, so send me a tweet and I'll reply. It's Woody Holton USC. Um, mm -hmm. And the book uh, it's called. I know most people are listening, but I'll hold it up for the for the people watching. Um, it's called Liberty is Sweet, mm -hmm. and the picture just looks like a, a guy on his on the feet on the on his on the ground capturing two guys with horses. But that guy standing on the ground, he has a secret, and so I'll put that out. Look at go look at the Amazon oh. page or or whatever, and see if you can figure out what that guy's secret is, and it'll help you understand really what the whole book is about. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on the show, Woody. We certainly appreciate it. Thanks for being here. All right, Krista. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. And to my audience, thanks for tuning in. Go to youtube.com for chess Chris Foss. Hit the bell notification. Go to goodreads.com for chess Chris Foss and all our groups on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. Liberty is sweet. The hidden history of the American Revolution just came out October 19th, 2021. Check it out. Learn your history. Uh, learn everything that went on in history. Don't stick your head in the sand like some of the stuff we're seeing right now. You want to learn what's going on, educate yourself so that you're smarter, not dumber. Anyway, guys, thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other, and we'll see you guys next time.